Greetings, stranger, and welcome to the Westgate District. I trust you have had a chance to allow your surroundings to impress upon you the relative comfort and wealth of Absalom's safest district. The Western Council, convened by its nomarch, Lady Selene of House de Mac, runs a tight ship here, you could say. In fact, I'd wager that some of its guards bemoan that the district is almost too low on crime. I mean, take a look at their faces, and you'll see the endless hours of nothing but clean streets and friendly locals eroding their features like water on rock. Ah, but don't worry about them, because I'm about to show you that there is still plenty of intrigue and spectacle to be found in Absalom's sleepy residential areas. I have acquired another carriage. Now, believe me, it is necessary now more than ever. Westgate may be one of the narrower districts, but it is over three miles long, so to complete a tour in any reasonable length of time, a mount is our only option. The route we'll be taking is quite straightforward, northwards, towards the elite Ivy District. There are some lefts and rights here and there, but in general it is a straight line, for the most part gently uphill as we get farther and farther away from the shoreline and the docks. You should know that Westgate is dominated by middle-class houses, chiefly occupied by merchants, uh, artisans, or lesser nobility, perhaps. As a general rule, the closer to the city walls, or the closer to the Ivy District you are, the more impressive the buildings become. This means that we are now actually in a relatively poor area of Westgate, but even Statue Street is easy on the eyes, no? Now, the district borders the foreign quarter to the east, so you will find the majority of trades and services available over there. Uh, for this reason, I'll try to meander gradually eastwards as we go uptown. But don't worry, the Sally Port itself is definitely on our route. Uh, before we set off, permit me to wet your palate for touring by telling you a dark bit of history in Westgate, although many of the locals around here might contest my choice of adjective. But did you find the time to admire the statues that surround us? Well, they give the street its name, of course, and they are all just so perfect, even down to the last detail. Now, the obvious question is, what are they all fleeing from? And then, why towards the puddles? Don't they know what manner of nasty fate awaits them there? Well, in truth, these poor souls did not have much choice. Why, yes, indeed, every single statue here was a living, breathing person once, before they were petrified by the breath of a gorgon. Uh, you see, about 700 years ago, uh, the person in charge of the local office of prisons was a rather eccentric wizard called Valtias the Redeemer, and he had a problem. Westgate's cells were overflowing, but this being a district where crime is caught swiftly and justice dispensed mercilessly, uh, with the majority of offenders not dangerous to the population. So, thought Valtias, what if we were to allow most of the non-violent criminals to go free? Well, this was almost a good idea, until, being an eccentric wizard, the bureaucrat decided to let loose a gorgon that he had to hand also, and turn the whole thing into a spectacular game for Westgaters. The prisoners and the gorgon were both unleashed onto a street close to the puddles, and anyone who survived, or otherwise escaped the ordeal, had their sentence waived. Those who didn't contributed themselves to their audience's sudden and zealous interest in statue collecting for their homes and gardens. Other statues were left here to line the street, which quickly became overwhelmed as the annual Charge of the Gorgon exploded in popularity. Over the years, though, the rest of Absalom came to view the Westgaters' unique approach to justice with increasing weariness, which evolved into outright hostility. And then, in 4714, the inevitable happened as the Gorgon got loose and petrified a good number of Westgaters, as well as the prisoners. And this finally generated enough momentum for the District Council to ban the practice entirely. In recent years, though, a local movement to bring back the bull has gained an impressive amount of momentum 
and posters, leaflets and tavern songs all urge their fellow Westgaters to pressure the council to reverse this decision. Regular demonstrations take place now by the Sallyport and Mithril Hall, many of them led by up-and-coming politicians from poorer Westgate neighbourhoods who feel that a regenerated charge of the Gorgon might alleviate what little crime does take place here. Oh, and I can see you wondering why many of these remaining statues are headless. Well, it is something of a local game. A technically illegal, of course, but the sense of entitlement to the petrified remains of non-violent criminals in Westgate is strong. I hope this contextualises the district for you as we proceed. Westgaters are, above all else, loyal to their traditions for tradition's sake. Any deviation will be taken with the strongest offence. So, while you are unlikely to be mugged on a street corner here, you should still watch what you say. Do not underestimate the power of a disgruntled local. In fact, the tavern on the right here complements this message quite beautifully. This is the Groggy Froggy, an establishment that has experienced quite a reversal of fortune in recent years. For the longest time, this was a family-owned business, operated by Mr. Claude Wunker, a gentleman of ill reputation who frequently berated and abused his staff. Luckily for them, the Froggy is on Statue Street, and Claude became one of the local victims of the Wayward Gorgon's rampage nine years ago. By this point in time, the fellow had no friends remaining to speak for him, so his body was never restored. Instead, the tavern unexpectedly became a cooperative business, run by its staff, who displayed their goodwill to Mr. Wunker by making his statue the prime attraction of the tavern. Unfortunately, it was recently sequestered by an unknown party, so the Froggy's current manager, Anar Alaskin, is no longer able to hold regular clarding contests to give the statue a thoroughly creative coat of paint. Nevertheless, the business is booming. Now, while the Westgate district is insular in many ways, that does not preclude it from taking pride in its diversity. Specifically, notice how the architectural styles of the building change abruptly from block to block. This is partially due to Absalom's long history, which has had phases of fashionable styles like every nation, but it is also due to the influx of different human heritages over time. Let us not forget that the city at the centre of the world was founded by the god Eridan, who claimed all of humanity as his charge. Thus, in good time, representatives from all of humanity came to settle in Absalom, and as we approach the border to the foreign quarter and then swing northwards again, you can see a strong example of this ahead of us. Those buildings, in a Vudran style, make up Anandari Block, which was founded by the family of the same name literally thousands of years ago. The descendants of Adashra and Bimasla Anandari can trace their genealogies back further than most other families here. They made their money by capitalising on the locals' veritable obsession with all things Vudran at the time, from buildings to food. Today, Anandari Block is populated mostly by humans of Vudrani descent, and all Westgaters take pride in the significance of the block being contained within their district. Uh, now, it may not surprise you that gossip is a powerful force here in Westgate. So, as we cross through this commercial side of town, be sure to observe the rather flamboyant building there, sandwiched between the bakery and the carpenters. That is the Cianoval Agency, a private detective's office that has outperformed all expectations. Its proprietor is Erdan Cianoval, who became bored with bookkeeping at the foreign coin exchange and struck out on his own, solving crimes that are not particularly well suited to adventuring parties. Oh no no, please don't give me that look, I meant no offence. Erdan simply enjoys sifting through truly dizzying amounts of paperwork to detect even the slightest inconsistency. He is much less enthusiastic in chasing down bandits in the dead of night, so the agency is unlikely to step on the your toes. Indeed, if you are looking for work in this area, this might be a good place to begin. The agency is always looking to contract out the more... Um, hazardous elements of private investigation, wherein books are swapped for blades. 
and perhaps you should liaise with him when you find the time. <laughs> well, if on the other hand you are looking to show Mr. C. and Oval how real paperwork is handled, then I would instead advise you to seek employment from this building, passing us on our left. This is Mithril Hall, one of the best-kept administrative centres in all Absalom. Its honeycomb design is hard to appreciate from ground level, but a quick glance at any map will quickly reveal the insanity of whoever designed the place. Apparently, the architect became obsessed with honeybees and their undying efficiency in using the limited space of their hives. So they concluded that, uh, just like worker bees patrol their honeycombs, so should district councillors patrol their headquarters. Thus was Mithril Hall committed to the district. In practice, though, as you could imagine, navigating the place is a nightmare, even for a meticulous bureaucrat. So if you are seeking an audience with the Nomarch, I recommend catching her out of hours, or at least at some other venue. Incidentally, out of hours for Mithril Hall typically means well before sunset, because the building maintains quite short hours of operation, much to the frustration of local labourers who complain that this makes it nigh impossible for them to take time off work to make their voices heard. On the crossroads down there to the east uh, lies the Westgate Bathhouse, one of the oldest and best in Absalom. It is easy to spot due to its domed roof and small marketplace that pops up outside its doors every day, as opportunistic merchants accost people visiting the saunas and pools inside. Public and private bathhouses are quite common in this city, but nothing really matches the grandeur of Westgates, in my opinion. Prices vary from cheap, unheated communal soaks to luxurious private saunas that put most spas to shame. It could be a good place to unwind after the tour, if your back gets stiff from the carriage. Remember to ask for a map though, because the layout of a building as old as the bathhouse is always dungeon-like. Then, after you have soaked, I would suggest you stop by at the restaurant situated on the next set of crossroads after the bathhouse, humbly called To Eat the World. In all my years of world walking, I have never come across another eatery quite like it. To eat the world has only one item on its menu. Leftovers. And leftovers of what, you ask? That's the customer's gamble. The head chef, Samael Rantore, has staked his reputation on being able to prepare and serve any meal in all Galarian, so long as he is given sufficient notice. Wealthy clients will place a custom, usually unique, order many moons in advance of their table's reservation date, and Sam will hire whoever it takes to acquire the ingredients he requires. And he always requires a lot, and in good quantity, for the remaining customers are sold the extra portions and leftovers of the dishes he creates. Uh, mounted on the walls of the restaurant are the stuffed heads of the various beasts that have been sacrificed on the orders of his clientele, for Sam does not ask too many questions of how his food is sourced, so long as it is um, ethically done. We're swinging left now to approach the Sally Port, the mighty fortress gate that permits overland travellers entry to Absalom. But on the way, there are still two more things that I would like to bring to your attention. Firstly, note this block ahead of us, with um, sandstone and desert-like architecture defining its structures. This style is derived from ancient Assyrian, whose nation continues to supply many of Absalom's camels to this day. At the centre of this particular block lies the Tomb of the Living, whose upper floors are dedicated to burying officials with poor families, unable to afford um, appropriate funeral rites. A few times a year, a procession will troop down this road and into the tomb, carrying the body of a soul who has passed beyond the veil of this material plane. Yet, in the quiet corners of the city, there are those who whisper of a secret second use for the tomb knowledge of whose existence is a lethally enforced secret. But to those of us who pay close attention to the comings and goings of the powerful and the charismatic, a pattern can emerge. An oracle 
poised to take the test of the Starstone, and judged by all to be able to pass it. A wizard, besides Eridan, who had claimed to unlock the secret of immortality. A nobleman, officially disparaged as a conspiracy theorist and driven out of the city, yet who seemed willing to die to reveal Absalom's darkest secrets. All vanished on the eaves of their triumphs, all never seen again. Well, if you were to venture down past the oddly stringent security of this unassuming Assyrian tomb in a sleepy residential district, I suspect you might find answers. But take my advice, stranger, and share this information with nobody you would not trust with your life, for that is what you are risking. <laughs> or am I just spouting nonsense, a mad guide failing to follow his own words? Well, that is for you to decide. The final point of interest before the sally port takes up a block by itself. This greenery passing us now is concealing the Westgate Courthouse, which is similarly presented to that of the docks. Unlike that district's chaotic proceedings, however, the Westgate Courthouse is best known for surrounding an ancient reflecting pool filled with only the purest water. By tradition, which is essentially by law here in Westgate, defendants on trial are marched to this pool before proceedings begin, so that they might be compelled to reflect on their decisions and habits. Ah, but I can see you eyeing up what is getting larger before us already. We'll stop here for now though, because even this distance is plenty far to appreciate the scale and formidable defences of the sally port, and the zeal with which its garrison defends it. Actually, consult your map for me and check the scale. This structure is at least 240 feet wide, for that is merely the combined distance of the four drawbridges that can be lowered across its defensive ditch to allow passage. Personally, I would estimate its full breadth to be closer to 500 than 400 feet, and all this says nothing of the network of defences and fortifications that lurk inside Absalom's enveloping walls. As you have probably inferred already, the Sallyport is the reason why its district is called Westgate. Now, the gate itself is fundamental to Absalom's defence, and as such, uh, it is protected by a special mounted unit within the First Guard, called the Kortos Cavalry. This detachment of Absalom's military is traditionally only permitted to name itself such while outside of the city walls, however, so on our side of the Sally Port, they are known as the Sally Guard. But make no mistake, this is a synonym for the same group. Uh, this does have the curious consequence that the District Guard, uh, usually an independent organisation, is for Westgate a fully equipped and highly trained military unit, which goes some way to explaining why the crime rate here is so low. Many within the cavalry, including its current commander, Lord Winton of House Nymphs, uh, would like to allow the more militaristic name to be used even within the district, but the council has rejected this proposal on several occasions. Another reminder that tradition is king here. Uh, the sally port is wide open, as you can clearly see. Uh, the throngs of merchant caravans from all over Kortos, though mostly Diabel and Atari, uh, queue for hours just outside the walls while they wait for a chance to be inspected by a member of the cavalry and the Scrivener's Guild. While there are many gates into the city, the sally port is by far the largest, and most frequently targeted during wartime. For this reason, it has been designed to be able to integrate its protectors and mounts alike. Uh, there are no stairways inside, but wide ramps that permit mounted riders access even to the top of the wall. Assaulting the sally port is ill-advised with anything less than a specialised and highly prepared task force. Uh, finally, as we begin to move on, you might be wondering why Absalom, famous for its preference for camels and other unusual mounts, continues to field a horse-based military unit, and one that frequently sorties into centaur territory at that. Well, to be quite frank with you, I am not actually sure that I have an immediate clear answer. I would speculate that um, horses are more familiar to the majority of the knights if they have a military background, and that horses make more versatile mounts across rolling plains and hills than camels do. 
Perhaps, though, this is simply another example of that famous Westgate stubbornness, or the churlishness of Absalom towards those who also call Kortos and Erin its sister isle home. Whatever the reason might be, I do know that relations between the central population and the Kortos cavalry have deteriorated recently, particularly since the appearance of that blasted wasteland called Tyrant's Grasp just outside the city. I have no doubt that the dark powers coalesced there do nothing to alleviate tensions, but I nevertheless would propose that the tensions only exist in the first place because the Kortos cavalry refuses to switch mounts to something less offensive to centaurs. But there you have it. Uh, let us retrace our route a little and continue northwards again. You might notice that uh, the district becomes more spacious during these final visits, with green spaces flourishing closer to the Ivy District. Incidentally, um, these do not compare to the vast tracts of Druid-maintained land in the Eastgate District, which is something of a sore point for most locals. However, coming up on our left is a building that is almost too unassuming. The quintessential dilapidation and the lack of signage or presentation in an area as well maintained as this is perhaps something of a giveaway. This structure houses the Guild of Wonders, an assassination group reviled throughout the Inner Sea and beyond. Uh, do not worry, this is not a particularly well-kept secret, although the Guild does pretend to function as a taxidermy emporium to those who are somehow unaware. Behind this rather thin veil, though, uh, lies the respected entrepreneurship of Scion Lord Kaledo of House Marilla and his nibblings. The Guild of Wonders will take a contract out on almost anyone for the right price, and will even ensure your life against a violent death by guaranteeing posthumous revenge against any who would inflict one upon you. There are a few important restrictions, though, that um, ensure the safety of its day-to-day -day operations. Firstly, the Guild does not accept contracts that must be carried out on Absalomian soil, for that would be too close to home. Secondly, the Guild will kill neither Talden nobility, due to the Guildmaster's heritage, nor children, on principle. And thirdly, uh, priests of Calistria, Abada, and Asmodeus are all safe from its assassin's blades. Uh, precisely why these three churches alone are sheltered from the Guild is a matter of some debate here, uh, but its rules are never waived, with one notable exception. If you have purchased a Death Pact, as their unique demise-avenging scheme is called, then the one responsible for your murder will be killed at all costs. However, the one subsequently responsible for carrying out the revenge on your behalf will then be banished from the guild, and likely to be hunted down themselves by necessity. The Guild of Wonders' presence within Westgate is quite controversial. Most locals consider it a barbaric or at least distasteful institution, and would rather see the whole building torn down and House Marilla's operations relocated to somewhere more fitting to its business practices. But the Puddles, or Eastgate, are the regular top contenders. Ah, but where there is death, there is also always life. And this next location, just down the road here from the Guild, mirrors this universal constant. In a much more highly regarded building lies the Absalom Chirurgian Dispatch, a private ambulance and healthcare service used by the majority of Westgaters. The culture here considers hospitals to be an unnecessary debasement of proper healthcare. Doctors and other healthcare professionals ought to visit patients in their homes unless absolutely necessary, Westgaters maintain. Thus, the ACD stands ready to respond in an emergency or to dispatch nurses and doctors to make regular house calls to its clients. Indeed, it operates throughout the entire city, though response times in an emergency scenario decrease considerably once you leave Westgate. Ah, now on these crossroads lies one of the most pragmatic temples you will see. That impressive workshop is called the Father's Forge, and it is an excellent blacksmithy run by Rogland Turgerast, its cleric smith. For the workshop doubles as the city's largest temple to Torak, 
the dwarven god of creation and protection. Worship is a practical activity to Torag's faithful. Most will tell you that every dwarf at work at any forge is a pious act, with every well-kept half a shrine. But do not let this put you off placing an order there. Quite the contrary. The devotion the forge's smiths show to their craft has made this place one of the most sought-after sources of metallurgy in all Absalom. And farther up this street, by the next crossroads, is the Windarium. How best to summarise it? Uh, well, it is certainly and simply the very best clockwork engineering specialist shop in the district. Uh, in my opinion, probably in the whole city. Uh, the instructors at the clockwork cathedral and the coins notwithstanding. A specialty shop, to be sure, but a highly successful one, run by a brilliant duo named Simo and Mertian. Uh, that said, the Windarium has faltered a little recently, ever since Simo was promoted to First Gear, a highly demanding military engineering role. Paul Mertian has been struggling to maintain the business. Uh, apparently, Mertian's true passion lies in the rearing of badgers, so the Windarium is currently occupied by half a dozen of the charming beasts. I should contextualise for you that badgers are an extremely common pet to keep in Absalom, even more popular than the cats and dogs that dominate much of household animal life in other places. They are efficient rodent killers, but unlikely to destroy stored food, and also happen to be truly adorable mustelidae. So in short, they are perfect for the city. Indeed, it is actually illegal to harm badgers here, so wild sets need to be relocated with the utmost professionalism. Um, a shop called the Fierce Stripe here in Westgate uh, offers these services for private homes and for businesses, so it is not too uncommon to encounter a badger comfortably resting in a shop window. However, all this to say, the intrusion of so many badgers to the Windarium may become a problem in the near future if they are not handled delicately, so enjoy the clockwork while you can. Uh, this large building, by its lonesome on the street corner here, is the Westgate Heritage Museum. Every item inside has been carefully curated to increase the district's prestige relative to the other parts of the city, even if the historical authenticity of the artefact in question is um, up for debate. Uh, the place will also offer you a guided tour of the district, though perhaps not one quite as entertaining and neutral as mine, eh? Uh, needless to say, I perhaps have something of a conflict of interest in speaking much more about it. But uh, just know that adventurers like yourself might find employment there, uh, gathering powerful items to add to its collection, so long as you don't mind warping their history to suit Westgated tastes. On our left uh, now approaches the Metringer Sanitarium, a place of quote, experimental healing for the mentally unwell. Stories about this place abound with every colour and flavour, but most that originate from outside the district are on the side of distress and horror. Most locals, on the other hand, point to the fact that inspections by the Sally Guard have failed to produce any evidence of wrongdoing or medical malpractice. So far, at least. Word on the grapevine is that an anonymous and wealthy patron is willing to part with quite a sum of money to anyone brave enough to infiltrate the sanitarium and verify claims of abuse and, um, <clears throat> secret underground experimentation laboratories. I admit the tales spun by most are groundless fantasies, woven for compelling dramatic effect, but after the Tomb of the Living and the Guild of Wonders, would it really surprise you to learn of more nefarious activities within a place inhabited by souls proofed against the benefit of the doubt? Perhaps you should investigate for yourself and find out. Sorry, it has become such a lovely day again and here I am, raving about asylums. Let's readjust. Uh, ah, cast your eyes to the wall, all the way over to the west there, and try to spot the tops of three pyramids. Those mark the grounds of Menhemes Manor, a museum and ground space dedicated to the history and culture of Assyrian, the ancient and quite brilliant desert land to the south of Kortos. Unlike the Guild of Wonders or the Heritage Museum, the record-keeping and sincerity of Menhemes Manor's patron, Sion Lord Rogren Sviro, are legitimately authentic. 
Recall that the city at the centre of the world is almost 5,000 years old, and in all that time, Assyrian can claim, perhaps, to have held the most influence over its development, though I think Chaliacs may be able to contest this. Ah, now at this junction lies one of Absalom's most curious mysteries. This is the House of Seven Faces. You can tell by those, well, seven faces that adorn the facade of the building. This is a temple to Desna, the heavenly goddess of dreaming, luck, and exploration. If you are not familiar with this deity, then the temple must look nothing too out of the ordinary, especially by Absalomian standards. However, what do you notice about those decorations? Are they human, elf, dwarf, goblin? No one can seem to agree, because they seem to become a unique face at every angle. Moreover, why does their material look old, even ancient, while the temple itself is no older than a few centuries? And finally, here is the 100,000 platinum question. How could they appear overnight just after the temple was first opened. Well, answers to these, if they can be found, will surely also lead you to discover what the Seven Faces are meant to represent, which is also a source of much disagreement by all. There are more theories than there are stars in the sky, but personally, I am partial to the idea that Desna's divine realm, called the Sevenfold Cynosia, is linked in some symbolic capacity. As we approach the Ivy District, now just at the end of this road here, I invite you to reflect on the dual nature of Westgate. Yes, it is safe and quaint, and mostly a quiet place of residence and trade. Yet I find so much lurking here, just beneath the surface. I suspect that, to the politically engaged explorer who does not mind meddling in the affairs of the mighty, Westgate can hold more than a few dangerous traps. If you ever do find yourself in danger, and cannot rely on the Sally Guard for help, then I advise you to hammer on the doors of this final point of interest on our left, Cirola Manor. You are likely to be greeted by Venla and Urmas Cirola, one of the district's most powerful couples. Urmas is the chief physician of the Absalom Chirurgian Dispatch, and a quite brilliant surgeon alchemist, while Venla has attained the status of a once-in-a-generation politician with local Westgaters on account of her conservative disposition and passion for magical artefacts. She is also a retired member of the Pathfinder Society, one of the most influential and powerful organisations across Galarian, based in the Foreign Quarter here in Absalom. Do not worry, I see that burning curiosity. We will discuss the Society at some length when the tour reaches their headquarters. But in the meantime, while it would be a risk to bang on her door if a mob of angry Westgaters were chasing you, I suspect she would seize the opportunity to advance her own and her district's position if you were instead to bring to light some senior treachery or malice based in another district that you brought to her. Why, she even has a seat on the low council, which should tell you how deep her influence runs. Ah, but you are surely just a humble tourist, unlikely to cause any trouble. So rejoice, because we have now reached the Ivy District, the centre of the arts in the entire inner sea. Theatres, tea houses, tailors, and tastes all await you within its borders. While it is by far the smallest of the city's districts, it is also the densest for places to visit and note. Just remember that danger here stems from what you say, not from where you go, and you'll be just fine. So, I recommend you make yourself at home, and meet me back here in a couple of hours. There is some more immediate business I must take care of before I can resume my tour. Well, until then.